This is Trent Clark, CEO of Leadershipity, serial entrepreneur, uh, international speaker, and longtime coach in professional baseball, where I coached in three World Series. Today, I am welcomed on the Winners Find a Way show with my special guest, Matt Mieske. Say hello, Matt. Hi, Trent. Good to be here. Oh, man, it's great to have you. Uh, Matt Mieske and I go back a long way. Uh, former professional ball player, and Matt has done all sorts of different things. Um, one second. I don't know if you're picking that up here. Sorry about that. And so um, from that, I, um, Matt, you and I are Michigan kids, uh, both, both born and raised, I think. And uh, you're a Western Michigan Bronco, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So uh, for, for those who are just joining the show uh, first time, Winners Find a Way is the name of our show. It is all about winners that have overcome. For folks that know people uh, who they find to be successful, people who have quote unquote conquered it all, you know, this is a guy who went to the major leagues. You find out that uh, people have to overcome some challenges along the way and it is never easy. And so if you're tuning in for the first time and you face stiff adversity, you feel like losses are mounting and you need to find a better way. I think you came to the right place. You're going to hear great stories and insights. So if you're already an entrepreneur, an athlete, an elite performer, business leader, or just looking to start your journey today to being elite, I think this is the perfect place for you to learn. So I'm excited about having Matt join us today. Matt, tell them real quickly, where can they find you online? Well, being in the financial uh, industry, we are we have a lot of rules. So um, I, I don't have a Twitter or Facebook, but I am on LinkedIn and, uh, and I have a website, mattmieski.com. Um, Twitter and Facebook, they just started allowing us to do that like last year. Wow. Um, so I, I've chosen not to do that, but whether I do it in the future is, is kind of up in the air. Um, yeah, and a lot of your space, a lot of your space really stays in that LinkedIn space anyway. I mean, I'm not sure yeah. how much you're going to garner in the wealth management from Facebook or Twitter, but I certainly appreciate the fact that um, you are pretty locked in to talent and uh, and talking there where, where the business professionals are, which is commonly LinkedIn. Correct. And I don't feel like I need to share my every thoughts uh, regarding finances over Facebook or Twitter. Um, if I was in baseball coaching or something, I, maybe I would use that more, but financial stuff is more private. So I think it tends to lend itself to not having more information out there versus less. Mm. So great. Um, I'll tell you, let's, um, let's quickly talk a little bit about some highlights about you. Uh, Bronco Hall of Fame, by the way, in 02. Uh, you were a former outfielder in the major leagues, uh, 68. So you got a year on me, by the way. Maybe almost two on me, by the way. Um, Brewers, Cubs, Mariners, Astros, Diamondbacks, uh, all over an eight-year span in, your, in, the, in the major leagues. Drafted by the Padres in the 17th round, which is funny because you don't list the Padres as any of your major league experience. So there's a story there. Um, uh, traded to the Brewers and then, uh, to over your eight seasons, all pretty awesome. Um, best season in 96 with the Brewers, 14 home runs, 278, 374 at bats. Pretty awesome. Three all time mid American conference, uh, selection. I was also a mid America guy playing at the university of Toledo, a rival of the old Broncos. So I don't know if we ever played at the same time. I think you were already out by the time uh, my years at Toledo. So you were probably already drafted. I'm not sure Maybe. about that. Yeah. Maybe so, one year was overlap, but I don't know if we, we didn't play every team. So we may not have, we may not have played Toledo. Yeah. So in senior. 90, yeah. And so in 90, I think that was my, I think 91 was actually my first season for the Rockets. So okay. I think, I so, think we yeah. didn't overlap, but nope. um, so you know, uh, a career fielding percentage of 979. So, you know, obviously well known for your defensive skills. And also what most people don't know about you is you had a near death experience at a pretty young age that, that changed some things probably for you as an adult. So we definitely want to get into that. So Matt, thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm excited to have you. Yeah, it's good to be here. I like, uh, I like speaking with people regarding this topic on, on leadership. I think it's a um, 
an area that's sorely missed in our society today. And if anything that I've experienced can help someone else through a difficult time, then that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think, you know, that's why you, you, you come on a show like this, right? To, to take all these experiences you've had in your lifetime, which are, which are many, and, and coming from a, a different background, probably, I mean, we know um, the major leagues are, are not filled with tons of Midwesterners, right? Like it is, it is a lot of ball players that come out of California, come out of Florida, come out of the Sunshine States, Arizona, Texas, where it's easily, easily played 10 months a year. We do not play baseball 10 months a year in Michigan. So just FYI for everybody else, like you better have another sport of choice, right? We're happy to get 10 days, not 10 months. <laughs> 10 good days, right? Yeah. yeah, that's it. Um, it's so true. So you, you know, uh, probably it, it takes that whole new impression. Well, we should talk about this is that impression of how many now kids are playing all these games. When you and I were young, we played, all this practice. That's what we played because we knew, Hey, you might only get, if you got in 40 games, that was tons back in the day. Yeah. That was a lot. Yeah. Uh, I can remember um, my, my first year at Toledo uh, we played in a field that had drainage issues. Right. So I can remember my first year when we started, you know, we'd start games in the South, like in February or early March and we'd back, we'd be back up mid March which, you know, in the Midwest, that could mean 65. It could mean 35, right? So right. you don't know what you're going to get. And I would be standing in an inch of water in the outfield in the 30 degrees. So we would take the old ice bags that we'd use after the game and we'd bag our feet before we put two layers of socks on so you could keep your feet dry. Yeah, I, uh, I have to admit, I never did that. But <laughs> there were guys in Milwaukee that did that. And they used... Yeah. Uh, they use bread bags, like bread bags. Yep. Bread. bread bags worked in between layers of socks to keep your feet wet. But yeah, that's always a challenge um, early in the spring, trying to keep your feet dry. And once yeah. they get, once they get wet, that's yeah, miserable, but it's miserable. You're cold. It, it's tough to ever heat up again. Right. So, yeah. you know, it's tough when your feet get wet. And uh, I started with the bread bags and realized that those bags they were using to ice us down were, you know, twice the millimeter thick right so i was yeah. like oh man these are so much better i could yeah. i could stay drier but they were weighty you know yeah they were um but they work they work yeah so um thanks for coming on the show I'm, I'm super excited to talk a little shop let's let's get into um you growing up a kid you're you're a midwestern kid did you you grew up in the midland area and tell us a little bit about that real quick yeah um cold weather place um and today, a lot of a lot of kids specialize in, in one sport. I played all the sports on a seasonal basis, so wasn't exclusive um, to just baseball. But I knew when I was pretty young, five or six, that that was my favorite. That was my passion. And watching the Tigers growing up, yeah. I just knew at a very early age that that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Obviously, obviously you don't know you're going to make it at that time, but that was – that was my lifelong dream um, to get to that level. I didn't, I didn't even know what it was called. I just saw it on, on television and it was something that was interesting over time. You know, you learn that it's called the major leagues and yeah. okay, that's what I want to do. So yeah, from that point um, I would still play basketball and football and hockey, but baseball was always my favorite. Yeah. A lot of ice hockey in the, in the Midwest. Did you play ice hockey? Yeah. Yeah. I love but it. We didn't have, we didn't have any ice arenas in our area. So we played everything outside you know, as yeah. soon as the, as soon as the ponds or, or the water um, around us would freeze, we would play. We had a, a neighbor who would flood his backyard and make a rink in his backyard. Yeah. And I would play against kids that were five, six, seven years older. And yes, I mean, learn the hard, hard, you know, the hard way they check you over the snowbank and, <laughs> You'd disappear for about 20 minutes because you had to dig your way out. But um, yeah, it was, that was fun. I, I love playing that. And it, actually, if we would have had arenas, that would have probably been my favorite sport yeah. to play, but we just didn't have access to ice. There wasn't teams. Now they have high school teams that, that play, but um, everything was either um, pickup type games or, you know, not organized you just 
play against uh, whoever whoever's out there. It could be adults and yeah. Um, but yeah, it was fun. I love that. I love it, man. I tell you, you know, pond hockey. There's something special about pond hockey because it's always with friends, right? There's fellowship there. There's a lot of things going on, and it's uh, it's it's it, it kind of brings it to another level. But I would say the one thing about hockey that most people don't know is like. Uh, people think football is a hard game, like hockey, you better be tough. You have much less padding. You are much more exposed. And, uh, oftentimes in football, you know, both people know contact is coming in hockey. One person often doesn't know contact is coming, you know? And so like, that's, uh, you're not always ready for the hits and prepared as you'd like to be. So let's, let's pivot to your, your childhood. Um, you know, it, we had, I'll, I'll kind of go to, you know, the baseball thing. One of the things that was influential for me as a kid was I was 14 when the Tigers won the World Series. You know, the 1984 Tigers, they, they called them the bless you boys, right? And um, so you would have been about 15, 16 years old. You know, that they're a big influence in the Midwest and especially in Michigan, obviously. But was there some moment like along that path that was like the impactful point where you were like, man, I, I have got skills for this. Like I can do this. I can make this happen. Was there something that kind of led you to that? Um, I, I would say just on all the teams um, that I played on, a lot of times I played against competition that was older than I was. And that, that always helped mm -hmm. um, probably the point at which I realized that I really had a good opportunity um, was probably in um, Connie Mack. I was 16 yep. playing against um, 17, 18 year olds. And we were also part of a league where it was a men's league. So they had a lot of college players that would come back and play in the summer and guys who had finished college or played professionally and then we're done playing but they still like to play in the summertime and that kind of competition over the course of a summer for two summers playing about 50 games um, and being able to compete with them those guys had played a lot of them um, in mid-american schools or some of them were division one either michigan state or michigan and then some guys who had played in the minors and being able to not only compete, but do well against them. Kind of the first time I was able to really see how I stacked up. Yes. And then um, I played in the Michigan um, high school all-star game in Detroit at tight, the old Tiger Stadium. Mm -hmm. And um, got to see a lot of those guys who were same caliber. Um, and then I played uh, in the Olympic Festival um, after I graduated high school, before I started college. And uh, there were players from all over the country, uh, north, south, east, and west. I remember um, Mike Musina and Paul Carey and um, guys like that. That uh, Mike Musina is in the Hall of Fame. So um, other high school kids, the best in the country, and being able to go to that or being nominated to go play in that, that's when I kind of knew um, that I was kind of in – in that pool of people, but what you do with it and where you go from there um, is really dependent on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. For sure. You but, know, I think about some of the prime time Michigan players when, when I was, when we were kids and Smoltz was a little bit ahead of me. He might've been a little closer to your age and Avery was right in my age. And then, you know, Derek Jeter was right behind me a few years. Right. So, you know, yeah. three pretty high quality players. It turned out to be pretty good major leaguers right at the time. And, yeah. and there were many more, but I think those three just kind of stuck out to me and, you know, where you got a chance to size yourself up against what everyone was saying, like, Hey, if this isn't the best, this is pretty close. Right. Right. And, um, and I think that's, you know, you find that out. I had a similar experience that, I played with a really high level travel team and my last year at Connie Mack, I bypassed it to go play in the men's league because battle Creek was the host of the national championship. I was being you know, recruited to play on the best team. Cause, cause the host of that league 
who won the league was the national championship host. It was an automatic bid, right, to the nationals. So a lot of college players, a lot of just uh, former released pro players. And that's where I, I, the same thing, I kind of cut my teeth to say, hey, can I compete against these players? And you doing that at 16 is, is amazing. Um, and, and it's definitely validation. So I love that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about a time that you've had to overcome, right? A, a time you were up against it, you know, losing, found a way to come back and win, you know, down, but not out. Tell me a little bit about that, Matt. For me, it was when I was in AAA. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously had a lot of success in everything I did up until then. I had really never failed, not to any great extent, not like striking out, but really felt like I was up against it. And so I had just gotten traded from um, San Diego to Milwaukee, had played a ball the previous year. Wow. So quick. And, so for people who don't know, let me explain this real quick, Matt, before you keep going for people who do not know uh, in business, if you don't understand the major leagues is, is the end of seven levels. There are two rookie ball or low a ball clubs. There is a full season low ball a, a club. There is a high, there is a full season high level a, um, which are different leagues, often like the California league or the Carolina league. And then you hear uh, the double a leagues, which is now really progressing one step away from the big leagues. I like to tell a lot of players, you're one step away at double a or higher and triple a. Cause if an injury happens, they will call a double a or triple a player to the major leagues from that position. So at triple a, you are sitting you are literally the backup typically to the starter. If not, if there's not a, a utility, they'll have a backup obviously in the, in the league. That's, that's a, that's usually a taxi person, a taxi squad. You can hold a lot of different positions, but the number two is often sitting in AAA to get the reps because you don't, you don't, uh, you don't get enough at bats when you're a utility. Right. So I'd gotten traded in spring training five days before the end of spring training and played a, uh, high A the year before. Where, where are you in spring training with San Diego? Um, I was in uh, Yuma, Arizona. Yuma. <laughs> Yuma. Yeah, there's not a team there. First of all, I mean, I'd like to apologize for Yuma. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was way away from everybody else. Yeah. And I got traded to Milwaukee and they were in um, the Phoenix area. Okay. And um, Chandler. And so it uh, wasn't all the way to Florida. So that was good. No, thankfully. But we only had a couple of days before spring training ended. And um, I went right to the big league camp for a few days. And then um, when the season started, I went to triple A. So I skipped double A. I never played double A. Wow. And um, so I was um, 23. And um, I got traded as part of the trade for Gary Sheffield. So it was a big trade. And um, I think internally I put a lot of pressure on myself to justify why I don't know, but no, no one told me, Hey, you know, don't, don't put pressure on yourself. This, this happens. And, but I'd always dreamed of, of playing in the majors and baseball was always just kind of a, just what I love to do. Yeah. When I got traded, I realized, Oh, this is a little different than what I thought. This is actually a business and this stuff happens. You're yes. just, you're an asset. And if we can move you somewhere, they do it. Yep. So you go through all that, you know, emotional, um, uh, grappling with yourself and why did this happen? And you have to look at it as a good thing, but initially, um, you wonder why did this happen? I, I'd won the most valuable player in the minors two years in a row previous to that. And then, oh, you get traded. So that's what, that's what happens when you do really well. Well, I wasn't going to play right field in San Diego because Tony Gwynn was there. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew after a while that was a good thing because it was going to help me move the, move up the ladder quicker. Yeah. But I put a lot of pressure on myself and that in baseball as as you know, doesn't, doesn't work. Um, you have to play the game relaxed and the more you press, the worse your results are. So probably, Midway through May, um, ish, six or seven weeks into the season, I remember looking up at the big scoreboard in Mile High Stadium in Denver, and I was hitting 169, and uh, it was really it was embarrassing to me. It was, um, you know, I, I probably lower than your weight at that time. It was, it was, and 
I had, I'm used to seeing a three at the, at the start of my batting average. And yes. Um, so I, I think it, w- it was just a, a time where I was pressing harder and harder and harder. And you're, you're one step away and you want, you want to succeed so much and get there that the, the results were just diminishing. And um, I just was burying myself farther into um, kind of o- almost a depression, really. It was yeah. failure. Failure for me um, it really never happened in any sport or any and academically, nothing. And now with the, the thing that's most important in your life that you've pushed for since you were five, you're failing. And, and I found myself questioning do I really want to keep doing this? Mm. Um, is it worth it? Um, all those thoughts that go through your head when you're struggling as everybody does. And so for me, it was, um, just a matter of being able to relax. Um, I mean, that's really where, where faith started to come in. Then God used that in, in my life in a big way. And, um, my season turned around. Um, I probably had over 200 at bats at that point or close to it. And I ended up the season hit 277. So I wow. think from that point forward, I hit like 350 or 360 yeah. just to lift it to that point. So um, just a big difference. And, and I learned so much about myself and about baseball. Mm. And uh, I was always able to look back on that experience, though, whenever I was struggling and, and um, lean on that to not, not get too discouraged. Not that you won't get discouraged, but not get to the point where you're depressed or despondent or yes. just, you know, at a complete loss and, 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 um, not able to, you know, be able to do anything. And, yeah. um, but it, it was, it was that experience for me that was very pivotal and it could have went either way. And there's, there's guys who run into that and they never make it out. And then they end up out of the game or whatever sport they're in. So, um, thankfully, um, I was allowed to get through that. And, um, and I've used it countless times in my life. And, and as I talk to other people, it's, I think it's encouraging. Um, cause I know, I I know what it is to, to be at rock bottom. Mm. So there's tons of stuff to unpack there, right? (laughs) Like, like Gary Sheffield, first of all, like huge trade, like the Padres were pushing at that time for, you know, another title. Right. And, uh, and they, and they were kind of getting on their way. They were building that foundation for one that went to the world series later. And then um, you mentioned mile high stadium, which of course at that time there were no Rockies. Denver was the triple A team. Um, and so you played in mile high, the old football, the Broncos field and where the ball, you know, you could pop one up to the second baseman that actually leaves the stadium because that, that uh, altitude there, no joke. Yeah. And then, um, you know, did you have, did you have this? And, and and I tell you what you mentioned that was really important to me was pressing um, pressure on myself. Like that doesn't serve very well in baseball. I don't know if that serves in any sport, right? Like when we get tensile and we and we and we contract and we constrict, like all of a sudden we're not free. We're not free to flow if we're so uptight and so pressured. And what I like to tell people is uh, pressure is self applied. Like no one else can put pressure on you. Now, I'm sure if you honor the organization, you're listening to the general manager who's like saying, hey, Miski, you know, we made a big trade for you. Like we back more. Of course, you honor, you respect them. You can feel that pressure. But some fan who goes, hey, Miski, you're garbage. And you're like, going, I don't accept that pressure because like, why would I let that in? Right. 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 So Absolutely. We have to allow it. We have to allow it for ourselves. And so, um, we typically self-apply our pressure uh, on the magnitude of what we decide for, right? And of course, your desire to succeed all this is allowing, like, hey, I've got to keep going, Matt. You got to be better. You got to work harder. You got to, you got to, you're today, you're going to do it. This is it, you know? And and you can just imagine as that's not working. Right. I mean, it, 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 this uh, has always it, worked. I've always worked hard. Always led to diminished returns. And I think that was something that you could, remember um as as time went on and get yourself out of those spots and and i think um for me it was being able to really avoid prolonged periods of 
of slumps. Um, I really, after that, um, I really only had one other time the rest of my career where I really felt like I was in a slump and, um, which, which in the majors, it's going to happen because the other guys are good too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. um, Yeah. They're pretty good. Yeah. And, um, but I was able, I was able to get through that. And, um, but the stuff that I learned in the minors and going through that, um, really helped me and, and, in any sport or any vocation in life, you have to be mentally tough. And um, there's competition in business. There's competition in sports. Mm-hmm. There's competition in life. Yep. And learning how to compete and uh, and show up uh, is very important. And I think what you said that self applied pressure. Um, another thing that that helped me along the way, um, and I learned this when I was. 25 or 26, but, um, you know, I use it all the time with my kids, but, um, control the things that you can control mm-hmm. and the other stuff. Don't worry about it. Yep. You, know, you can, you control your, your attitude, how hard you concentrate and the effort that you give. You're not in control of the results. You know, as a hitter, you can, you can hit a screaming line drive somewhere well, somebody out in the field has a glove and they get paid to catch that, Yeah, you know, and get you out. You can't control where it goes after that. You did your job. So, and I think, um, in the business world, um, there's so many things that we can't control, but you can't control when you show up, how hard you work, how much time you put into it and whether you're able to concentrate or not. And the attitude that you have in good or bad times and, um, everything else, like you said, a self-applied pressure. And if, if you try to control the things that are outside of your scope, um, you could look at it like you failed, but you really yeah. didn't. That yeah. was one, one thing when I was, um, playing in Milwaukee that used to bug the crap out of me, but you know, people would, um, at the beginning of the season say, well, you know, do you have any goals for this year? Well, you know, the normal response is, well, yeah, I want to have 30 home runs and drive in a hundred hit 300, you know, that's my goal. But what I realized was goals are different than desires. Mm. A goal many times takes the help or assistance of someone else. Mm -hmm. You can have a, you can have a goal of doing that, but if you don't get your name put in the lineup and you don't get enough at bats, you're not going to reach your goal. Did that mean you failed? No. So there, there was a, a coach, um, that I had that, um, encouraged me to start focusing on again, things you control. I have a desire to do the best that I can. Mm -hmm. The outcome is also dependent on how often I get a chance to play. That's right. So what I learned was if you set a goal, you could be setting yourself up for disappointment because if you only get 200 at bats, there's no way you're going to drive in hundred runs. That's right. And, um, so did that mean you had a bad year? Well, in whose eyes you didn't, you didn't, you didn't fail. Yeah. You do the best with the opportunity that you're given and and it applies to anything that you do in life. And, um, so that was, again, as hard as that was, you know, my, 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 my one thing that I don't have any regrets, uh, about how I played or how well I did. Um, I wish I would have got to play more than I did, but I learned a lot through that. I learned a lot watching games, watching people, learning how to handle adversity, learning how to handle not getting what you, what you want and uh, being patient, that kind of thing. And all those are are life lessons that are, that are huge. And I've used countless times in, in in my job now. Um, And I wish I would have played more, but it was still at the highest level. And it was what was supposed to happen, I guess. Yeah. Well, I love that perspective shift in that because I think a lot of people can really glean from that, right? Like be careful how you set up your perspective and your goals. And we talk a lot about that with uh, titles. I can remember one year I was in a rebuilding year in the major leagues and one of the you know chief business folks set a vision that we would be a playoff team. And I'm like going, what? 
you know, I don't see that with, we weren't a very good major league team. We lost a couple of veterans. Our triple a team finished last. We did. We weren't sitting there with a bunch of prospects on the doorstep of greatness here yet. They still were developing and they were, they were coming along, but a little slower or, or they were younger at that level still. So it was a real stretch goal and vision. And the problem was you show up at all-star break and you're 25 games out of 500 and you're like uh i don't think this vision's gonna ever happen right and so now if it doesn't happen and you can't and, and no one can identify with that you know the the paradigm shifts everybody starts thinking hey it's all about me what do i gotta do because the team you know we're not that goal is not even you know reachable and so I, I think it gets really challenging and and again it could be some of the things that were out of his control when he kind of set that in place, a trade, someone gets injured and he's thinking, Oh, we're going to ride this, this player higher. And, and it's, so there's a lot of factors. So I think that's a really good reset for a paradigm of how people set their desires and goals and what they're going for, because we know that goals and things that we're doing really come down to the moment and moment day by day. That's how they're said is what you do today to get you. I always like to say, you know, this day for that day. Right. And, and I learned that from coach Manny over at uh, Michigan state, but this day for that day, like, what am I doing this day? Even though that day may be two years away this day, I gotta, I gotta train. I gotta get ready. I gotta work. I gotta, I gotta do it. And um, I, I think there's also some interesting perspectives that, Milwaukee makes this trade for you, obviously giving up a high, a high price player and Gary Sheffield, but they are my assumption. And is I'm assuming that, you know, they they've got eyes on you because you're a Midwest kid. They've seen you play college ball. They've also seen you compete at national level, um, you know, coming out of that space and not, and being resilient to that where you and I both know a lot of player that come from small towns or, or the North. And then we get on that big stage it's a bit intimidating when you play against players that have been playing on TV in college half the year and, and they're no, they're well known in the papers or nationally. And then, Hey, nobody knows who I am because I play at a smaller school or I'm from a, another area or, or in baseball, how many high school kids sign. And then you're playing against the top college players saying, Hey, how do I compete? They're three years older. They're more mature. They're bigger. They've got more experience. And the, and the mind starts getting into your own intimidation. Talk a little bit of that. That's huge. Um, <clears throat> I was able to draw a huge distinction between players from the South or players from the West and, and players from either the East Coast or the North or the Midwest. And um, when I started playing in the minors, it was – very quick for me to be able to discern between those types of players and, and, and their attitudes. Mm. And, and the biggest thing was, was work ethic. Not, not that players from the South or the West didn't have a work ethic, but when, when you don't have to practice indoors for three months to be able to go outside for three weeks and play games, you don't develop the same kind of discipline or mental toughness or work habits mm. when you are in the Midwest or somewhere that it's cold and you appreciate the ability or opportunity to go actually go out and play games. Whereas in those other places, it's all they do is play games. Yeah. Rarely practice. The weather's always nice. Well, why waste time practicing when you can play 80 or a hundred games? So I think that was one of the big um, advantages that I had and continues today. Um, everybody that gets drafted or signs has ability. Yes. And, and you don't, there's no gimmies. They don't give yeah. earned, not given. Right. And you're there for a reason. You can do something or many things very well, but every, everybody's there for a reason. Now, how long you stay or how long you play is dependent on a lot of other things, obviously your performance and your success, but baseball in particular, because it's an everyday thing, you have to have uh, a certain discipline. You have to have work ethic. You have to be, 
you have to be mentally able to bear that kind of strain on a daily basis and pick yourself up after you fail, which is, oh, by the way, most of the time. <laughs> yeah. And um, so to me, it was really growing up in that environment was conducive to building that, that work ethic and those habits and just being able to, to handle the, the strains and stresses that come. And, and I was, I was able to quickly see in a short season rookie ball where you play 70 games, I think those guys who were drafted as part of the Padres organization and part of my team in Spokane, um, it didn't take but two months to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff. Mm. You could see the talent, but you, you could tell the guys who, who weren't going to last very long because they just hadn't been tested. Mm. You know, you get punched in the mouth. How are you going to respond? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and that was weird because after a few weeks, those guys are looking at you like, who's this guy, mm. you know, and almost like you're not supposed to be, you're not supposed to be doing that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm from Pepperdine or whatever. And I, yeah. you know, um, and, um, I, that always gave me a quiet satisfaction because, yeah. um, and, and the thing that I probably feel the worst about is other players that went to Western Michigan or played in, in the Mac that never got a chance to play or never signed. Yeah. And I compared that to guys on my team or in that first season rookie league that, and, and, and that were, that were better or could have had a chance or should have had a chance. And I remember, um, about a month into our season in Spokane, we were kind of struggling as a team. And and I was getting tired of hearing kind of the whininess and the complaining. And and it was primarily those those guys, obvious, obviously, that were from warm weather places. And, and I just I just called them out. I just said, look, I'm, I'm tired of, of hearing this. I said, I played with guys back home that are better than you and they didn't get a chance to sign. You have an opportunity and you're wasting it. And I don't want to hear this anymore. That's the last, that's the last we heard of it. And, really? um, that's so, awesome. but it, it was just, it was annoying to me and it, it was the facts. It, it, yeah. it was absolutely true. Yeah. And, um, once you cut that out, you just focus on playing together as a team and, and we won a league championship yep. that year. And, you know, as, as you have done, winning is a lot, is a lot more enjoyable than losing. I've been on winning teams. Sure is. And I was on losing teams. Yeah. And yeah. You, you mentioned, you know, being out of things by the all-star break and then everybody starts to focus on themselves instead of a team. And yeah. that's just a, a poisonous atmosphere. Yep. That can happen in, in any industry, any field, any yep. corporation. And, um, having been a part of both that the whole, the whole concept of winning, there are certain criteria that are present when you're winning and there's certain criteria that are present when you're losing mm. and they are polar opposites of each other. So let's um, dive into that a little bit before I get into that. Let's dive in. I, I have a question for you. I know you shoveled snow as a kid because that's common. Did you shovel snow to make money? Never, never. Okay. We shoveled, I, I shoveled we snow shoveled, to make money. <laughs> like we, we shoveled snow to play hockey. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I thought like, you know, I looked at that, you know, going into like work ethic. I realized like how much you have to work to play and do certain things. And, and I, I did it to make money. And I realized like, wow, I was excited about making $25 on a school snow day. Right. Like that was all, that was big money. Yeah. And, but you know, I also realized I couldn't actually go enjoy it. Cause I was exhausted. Right. <laughs> like I was like, man, I just, I just pound, you know, I moved a foot of snow off, off, off 12 driveways to make that money. Right. And I'm oh. like going, I'm cashed. Like I'd love to go to the movie, except I can't lift my arms. So like, it, it's crazy. And you know, you, you went and shoveled the lake to, to go play the pond, man. I mean, that was, that's what you had to do. And so it was, it was, there's a, there's a in, inherent work that comes around, that comes with these uh, four season conditions. And I remember talking 
uh, uh, to uh, Dusty Baker when he was the manager of the Giants. And he just said, you know, man, those Midwest kids, man, you can spot them. They've got it figured out. And I always, I always, that, that stuck out that he said that. I was like, man, like, what does he mean by that? Like, like it was always interesting, right? Yeah, so it was too big, kid. Yeah. Let's come yeah. back. Let's come back to what are those winning attributes versus what are those losing attributes that you see on those teams? Attitude is very important. Yeah. Um, commitment, determination, discipline, um, truly caring about other people. Mm. Humility. Hum- humility is huge. Big itty. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, those, when you, um, when you care about other people, takes the a focus and attention off yourself yep same as humility and the opposite would be you know being arrogant or being prideful yep and at the end of the day in, in professional sports again anybody who has signed a professional contract they've got ability or you wouldn't you they wouldn't sign you yeah so you don't um you don't really benefit from the me, 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 I, 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 you know, yeah. Um, kind of look at, look at the, the name on the, on the front of the uniform, not the name on the back. And who do you, who do you play for? And, you know, to me, that just, that makes it a lot less complicated. Yeah. But if, if you're, if you're wasting energy pulling against someone and rooting against them, that's just the, that's a waste of brain power. Yeah. really and it's so much and it's so much funner to win yeah and, and do it together and do it together and um i think that's probably the one common thread that winning teams have S- some level of chemistry that is helping them accomplish what they do and when I, um when that's I think, important yeah when i think about that chemistry i, I think you hit it on the caring I mean, I think when you actually genuinely care about the person next to you, and I think it's one of the strongest things about the military when you talk about, or the Olympics, which, you know, of course, um, from the movie, right, uh, the mir- miracle about the 80, you know, he's like, hey, the, the, the name on the front's a whole heck of a lot more important than the one on the back, right? Yeah, <laughs> Herb Brooks. Like, well. And so, yeah. and the military, like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my life in your hands and in your hands and, and your life's in mine. Like we're all in this together. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute. This all, this all of a sudden just got upgraded to a whole nother level of importance. Right. Yep. And, um, and good teams really understand that. And I always have appreciated that, you know, being on teams and good ones and bad ones, mostly good ones. Um, and being involved with organizations that have a true goal to do something together and how each person inside that organization has a role and responsibility to go meet our expectation of, of winning or whatever that final, you know, that outcome. And, and it doesn't matter, you know, your color, where you grew up, you know, what's your culture at home, you know, if you know, what's your family life, like, like none of that matters when it's all focused on what you need to accomplish together. Right. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't supersede, those goals. And, and I think when you, when you focus on that, it does, it does help you to relax. And I think you, your performance is actually better. The outcomes are better. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, pride is a, a significant problem mm. for a lot of people. And, it's different than being um, proud. Mm. Pride is different than being proud. Yeah, let's dive into that a little proud, bit. Because proud you hear is it said uh, so. You hear it said so much, right? Yeah. Like you know, we got Tiger Pride, and you know, it's we put it up on billboards at the high school, and you know, we talk about this pride, and I mean, we use it in our culture. We use gay pride. We use we use pride like real easy, right? Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about. You know, there's a lot of people that think pride is bad, right? Pride is arrogance. Pride is this. Let's talk about the difference between pride and proud. Pride, 
to me, pride is an attitude. It's the way you carry yourself, which can be very negative. Being proud of your accomplishments is something to me that's more internal. Mm. You feel good about what you've accomplished and, and no one else knows. No one else has to know. Yeah. You can be proud of what you did or how you handled the situation. Pride is something that you carry with you and, and it expresses itself in a lot of negative ways. And, um, you know, you can take pride in the way you go about something or way you do something, but, um, when pride becomes arrogance, that's a problem. Mm. And, um, so I, I think the word gets, gets misused and, and confused at times. It's, it's okay to feel good about what you've done, but not to the point where you're boasting or gloating about it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and to me, I, I always tell people, um, when I was playing, I didn't, I didn't need someone to tell me if I had a good game. I didn't need someone to tell me if I had a bad game. Right. I knew if I, we know what both look like. (laughs) Absolutely. And you, you did your job and and you can rest in that. That, That's, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you get paid to do. Yeah. And, um, I didn't need anybody to tell me if I made a mistake. I I knew it. Mm -hmm. Now work with me on how I avoid that the next time, if it was, something that was avoidable or um but you know that you're you're never as bad as as someone tells you are and you're never as good as someone tells you are Mm. and 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 i think in our day of social media i always um chuckle at things i see and things i read because um you can almost read through most comments and and understand if someone's looking for affirmation or someone's Mm. looking for attention or someone needs a pack on the back and you can tell just by the things that they things that they say and um i don't know some people need that i guess but um to to me pride is a problem Mm. with a lot of our society and, I would um, say it's, it was one of my major motivators as a kid was to make my parents proud. I felt like my parents sacrificed a lot of things so that, you know, me and my brothers and my sister could have things that they didn't have. Right. And so I thought like, man, I, I want to make my parents proud. I thought that was, that was a driver for me without a doubt. Now I would tell you that in my life, I, and I can remember my father you know, I was out in the driveway shooting hoops one day and one of my buddies was over and I was like, yeah, I scored three touchdowns in a football game yesterday, you know, and my dad called me in and he's like, so you're talking to your buddy and like, why are you bragging? And I'm like, well, I wasn't really bragging. I was just telling about the game, but it was, it was all about pride and, you know, this, and he, and he was like, and he told me, he was like, you know, Hey, if you're good, you don't need to tell anybody they'll know. And you'll know too. And I was like, oh man. So, so this is now fast forward, you know, 40 years. Right. And, and it's all, Hey, look at me, social media. Like, and I don't even understand it. Like I, I can't go out there and go, I don't know if you know or not, but I'm awesome. Like it's when I think of like the five lowest moments in my life, I think pride superseded every one of those everyone yeah like and and, you know there's a common thread here and it's me me i i attitude that went right in front of that going hey how'd that work out for you clark you know like not good not good i think if anybody really examined their life they would they would be honest with themselves and realize that statement is completely true about everybody Mm -hmm. and um there's a reason why humility is, is talked about so much, uh, in scripture and pride yeah. is as well. You know, pride is comes is, before is the pride fall. before the fall. Is that scripture? Yep. Okay. Pride comes before the fall. It's one of the Proverbs. Um, but in rea- in reality, we, we can be honest. We all have that happen in our life. 
And, mm. and when we're around people like that, they can be really abrasive and, and hard to be around. So I always think about that. Well, I, I, I never want to be like that if I can all avoid it, because I know that it bothers me when I'm around people like that. I don't want to, I don't want to make someone feel that way. And um, there's one thing that, well, there's a lot of things, but one of the big things that baseball taught me, I think was to be humble because you fail so much. Even if you're a yeah. great hitter, you fail seven out of 10 times. Yeah. 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 You, you learn to deal with failure or you're not going to last you're very out. long. Yeah. And um, I think failing under pressure, failing, when there's people watching, when there's a lot at stake over and over and over again, and, and you have successes as well, but learning how to deal with that when you're in a pressure environment and you fail, even though you did everything in your power not to fail, learning how to handle that um, develops humility over time. You just can't flick a switch and say, okay, I'm humble. Yeah. No, that, that's something that is ground into you because of circumstances or experience. Um, and, I, and I'm just, it, it doesn't mean you never, never deal with it again, but that was one of the things that stuck with me. And um, I'm thankful to have done what I did. Uh, I was, I was fortunate to be in, in the right places and obviously you have to have talent, but a lot of things got to go your way. Yeah. And I'm just, you know, I'm thankful for all the opportunities I got and for the career that I had, the job that I have now. Yeah. And, um, and like you said, if, if, if you are good, you work hard at it, people know, people respect that. You don't, you don't need to, you know, do this kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And, um, and then you just go on. It's, it's just, I think that's just, it's just right. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. And not everybody's like that. Let's talk a little bit about that resilience, right? Like I always talk about hitting is a David and Goliath kind of story, right? Like it's like, Hey, this super all-star pitcher who's got one of the top talent, he and his catcher is a battery. And these two people have nothing more intent than to get you out. And by the way, they're going to recruit seven of their friends to help. Like it is nine against one, right? Like, like you could say like the runners have no impact on what might happen other than maybe like a hit and run change the defensive schematic. Right. But like very little, very little input in what's going to happen in that David and Goliath story. So I think the resilience of failure in that is big. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, your, that transition, like those things you learn. Like I, I, I say that, you know, when you talk about like players that can't make it, you know, a lot of people ask me like, Hey, who's the best player you ever coach? I'm like, Oh, you don't know them. They never made it out of double a, <laughs> like it's, they were too super talented, you know, and, and didn't, couldn't put those things together for couldn't, couldn't face the failure, couldn't face the self-discipline, you know, all, all the things that will trip you up that have nothing to do with how fast you run, how hard you throw, how well you hit all those things. Right. So let, let's talk about those lessons that you learned and, and then, and then how you translate that into a wealth manager and running your firm now. Well, resilient is, is a good word. Um, and for me, um, the learning curve was a lot like, a lot like baseball. I mean, a lot of the things that helped me in this job were really things I learned throughout the course of my life. Obviously being in the majors for eight years, you're around guys who make a lot of money. I mean, I was, I was paid well, but I was one of the lowest paid comparatively, but you, you just see things when, when people have wealth, what they do with it, what that means to them, how they spend it, stupid, stupid mistakes that they make and things that they buy that are just, you just shake your head. I, I won't mention any names or, or anything, but um, the, the point is that um, with a lot of money, you can make a lot of mistakes yep. and, and, and still keep going. Yeah, that's and, right. and, that's right. and on the other end, when I was growing up, my parents went through bankruptcy. Wow. So that was the other end of the spectrum. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you, you just wonder if you're going to get, you know, a new pair of shoes for the basketball season. 
Yeah. Or you got to wear the ones last year that have holes on each side. Yep. Um, and, and I, and I love my parents and respect them. They did, they did their best always to give yep. us what we needed. Yep. But from a financial standpoint, coming into this job, having the full gamut of from having nothing to having millions and, and understanding how to relate to people that are in either camp or anywhere in between has really been um, helpful to me to be able to put myself in someone else's shoes and try to understand yeah. their situation better. So the, the school of hard knocks, you know, learning uh, what we went through when, when my parents went through bankruptcy, being around, yeah. be around players that squandered money. Um, and, and, and there's all kinds of stories in multiple sports of people, players who made millions of dollars and ended up bankrupt. So you can get there a lot of different ways. Um, but, but those life lessons, um, carrying those into this job, um, have been very helpful. And I think just the people that I've been fortunate to work with over the last 22 years, have been all over the map as far as their situations. And you learn from this person's situation and you apply it to someone else's without mentioning names, but from a concept standpoint, here, here's what this person went through. This is what I learned. This is how they got out of it. This is what they did to move forward in their life. And mm -hmm. you might be able to use that technique or that strategy as well. And, um, I, I learned something every day. I, I, I know a lot. Um, you have to know a lot to do this, but honestly, I learned something every day, sometimes a lot of stuff. And, um, yeah. I think if we ever stop learning or think that we know everything, we're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good, uh, tip to remind people, right? Like it's, it's a danger zone. We're like, yep, yeah, I've gathered all the knowledge. I'm good. <laughs> like, that's it. Like not likely. Um, what do, you, what do you think the one superpower is that separates you that, that, that kind of catapulted you to that 1%? Well, before I became a Christian and after I became a Christian, it's probably a different answer. Oh, really? Um, Let's talk about that. Yeah. When did, you, did you become a Christian while, like, while you were playing ball? Like, you didn't grow up with it? Yep, in AAA. Yep. Okay, so this was kind of the time where you found this faith, you're up against it, changed, found your faith, you know, turned i mean just turned to a different lifestyle a different attitude a different place for yeah, sure 100 percent. and so what was okay so what would have been the superpower before your hard work and your effort i would uh i would say i was driven okay and so after uh my faith has been my foundation since then really and it changed my perspective on life it changed my perspective on everything that I do and, yeah. um, re, re, uh, evaluate your purpose. Why, why you're here, why you were made, what you're supposed to do. Um, why you're doing what you're doing, why you go through what you, and having a, an ability to, um, have a perspective that's different than me or I. And, um, so before, before that, Baseball, I guess, baseball probably was my God. Mm. And dangerous territory. Oh, for sure. So yeah. your, your happiness or your, your well being is, is completely dependent on your results or your performance. Well, and you and I both know who that, and, and, and just because I say dangerous, I don't want to say it's not uncommon. Right. You and I no. both were around a lot of people and that was it. And the danger that I say, as I say, that is, is I watched that pulled from a lot of people and like, wait a minute, you're taking my God away. Like, yeah, it's time to go. And it was like, cause you, like you said, it's a business. Right. And then they're lost. There's, there's a, there's a lot, there's a, there's a, um, you know, there's a mourning, right? Because you've lost something. And of course, a, a deity, how do you lose that? I don't even know. But like, if you're talking about something above and beyond, that's almost supernatural. And you put this up on this pedestal and it's just ripped out. You can imagine the responses are unlikely good. No, people are going to, people are going to fight that. Yeah. You don't want to lose something that you worked hard for, whether it's yep. your job, your business, your health. 
uh, your family members and, um, but it happens. And then, and then what, you know, is the world over? Is it ended? Are you done? How, how do you, like you mentioned earlier, resilience, how do you wake up the next day and face the challenges of that next day? Mm. And if your motivation is only on yourself, you will come to the end of yourself. Mm. And if you're trying to please man, man will disappoint you. Yeah. I'll disappoint I mean, you. Cause you can, I mean, you know, right. Absolutely. Like, I'm human, man. Like I, I came to that. I came to that in, in my life. I came to that conclusion about the same time I became a Christian in AAA in, in 1992. Yeah. My, my previous two years, I won the MVP of the league in, yeah. in rookie ball and then in a ball. So again, you talk about desires or goals at that time. It was, it was a goal. Well, well, I just want to do better than I did last year. Mm. Well, I came back in year two and I did it. Well, then in year three, I, I just kind of, I kind of thought to myself, well, this is kind of a trap because I'm not going to win the MVP 11 yeah, years only in a one, row. Right. <laughs> right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that 11 years in a row. You can't keep, that was just, that was a, um, an accomplishment that was special and, but I was setting myself up for disappointment because mm. how, how are you going to beat, how are you going to beat that? Yeah. And cause likely you're not. Um, and at, at about the same time, I mean, that's when I became a Christian and I think God used that in, in, in my life to help me to realize that he's in charge of the results. Yeah. We just have to go about whatever it is we're doing in the right way. And there are right ways to do things. Yeah. Whether it's business or education or sports or family relationships. And, um, and, and we're really, I think as a nation, as a world, we're really suffering, um, in that way because men aren't being the leaders that they need to be. Mm. And our society has over time, made men think differently about their responsibilities mm -hmm. and uh, made it easier to get out from underneath that responsibility. And, um, and, and we have a crisis because of it. And yeah. um, so uh, that, I we, think Matt, that's got to be episode two. <laughs> Cause yeah. that's, that's a whole, that's a whole tough topic. Right. Yeah. Um, but we do, we do get a wrap here. So, finish off with a couple things for me. One is you had a lot of success. You've won a lot. What's the best battle you've conquered in your lifetime? I think it was conquering self and, and take, taking the, taking the focus off myself and, and focusing that on other people, you know, most importantly on God and, um, and, and not being, I don't think I was ever a, a narcissist or anything, but an athlete is always in tune with their body, how they feel yeah, and what you need to do or, or when you need rest or what you need help with or, or need something fixed or whatever. And, um, I think by, by nature, if, if you're an athlete, you, you feel that and you can't, um, you can't avoid the fact that you're going to be really in tune with yourself. But I think over time you can really become too absorbed with that and everything that goes along with that and what that means. And, yeah. um, so once you take the focus off yourself and, and put it on God and then in your, your marriage and your family and then your job and then uh, others. Your, your others. Yeah. Your ministry, whatever that is. Yep. And um, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of like a pyramid or a triangle. And so you keep God at the top of that. And that's a good foundational piece. Triangles are good when they're based at the bottom. 
Mm. You flip that upside down and you put God at the bottom, that triangle becomes very unstable. Yeah. And anytime that I struggled in my life after that, I just look at that and that's the answer. Where are you spending your time? Have you got those priorities in your life twisted or turned or upside down? And, and I can look at other people and within a few questions, know why they're having problems in their life. Mm. And it's, and it's almost always directly related to where their focus is at in regards to those areas in their life. Mm. And, um, so I, I think keeping that in order helps keep your life in order. Doesn't mean you won't have problems or yeah. face difficult times, but you're ready to handle them head on with both feet on the ground. Well, I think I think it kind of comes in like you know, kind of the best way to win, right? Is 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 keeping that perspective. And when you see that from that top level, right? There are so many, like when you have money, you have success, you have homes, you have, you, you don't have any needs anymore. You just have wants, right? Like that's all we have. And we still have those, by the way, everyone still has them, yeah. but, but you know, it is, it, it's so easy to cut out what's important because you don't, you don't go running away from your faith or what's important in your life or those people, even, even like your mom. Right. It's just that it's so easy to be like, ah, well, we're going to Cabo for the weekend. I just I couldn't get to the phone and call you, mom. And I couldn't I couldn't spend time in the word. I couldn't you know, do what has always been important to you that now all of a sudden you move out of, out of your limelight and, and, and filter it out. Absolutely. It's so easy. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, um, so good to, to spend time with you, Matt, today. Um, again, you can find him on LinkedIn, Matt Miski. Uh, LPL is his, uh, you know, he's a, a advisor there for them. As you can see his, uh, his, his credentials there on LinkedIn. Um, let's finish with uh, the quote, quote of where you go when things are tough for you. Uh, you know, is, is there a verse? Is there a quote? Is there something that you read that, that sets you back into like, Hey, this, this, this can regulate me very quickly and it's kind of get my, get me back to center. Proverbs three, five, and six Ooh. trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. Nice. nice I'm a, nice. uh, I'm very analytical and yes. And I pride myself dangerously on being able to figure things out. Yes. So the danger is leaning on that ability or that intellect or that, that knowledge, because there's a lot of things that we can't figure out. Right. And um, so for me, that one hits me a couple times a week and um, it's good to memorize verses. That's, that's one that I have burned in my forehead and, um, I have to remind myself of it all the time because I like, I like to know, I like to figure things out and yeah. Um, some things are a mystery and will yeah. continue to be a mystery. Yeah. Um, I'd love to see if we get all the, all the data and all the information, but there's always that lean, not on your own understanding. <laughs> and, yep. uh, and so for me today, Matt, I was thinking about this this week, knowing, you know, you're on my show and the week we've known each other for a number of years, we've done work together. Um, Matthew 5, 16, you know, let your light shine. Let your, I'm sorry, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. I've always looked at you that way, Matt, you know, from the time I got to know you, it was after, you know, you came to Christ, of course, but you were a guy who was a light in a pretty dark place. You know, uh, I, I know I, most people don't think a pro baseball is a dark place, right? But like, right. there is a lot of uh, temptation. There's a lot of challenge inside it. Um, it is not an easy road to navigate. And people could talk about, oh, well, it's got to be easy. You're making millions. And I, I never made millions either. And um so it was challenging. And I think that there's people that just carry themselves and, and that light shines. And you're one of those guys. I thought of that right away when I saw that. So 
And, and of course it's Matthew, you know, five sixteen. you know, I'm sure, yep. you know, you were probably named after this first, right. You know, of course, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. um, but for, for those today, uh, please, uh, follow the show on YouTube live, uh, winners find a way coming on podcast in July. We're really excited about launching that this next month, many more videos on our leadership channel content for you. We are on at leadership at Instagram and Twitter and at Trent M Clark. You can of course follow my handles there, uh, our website, leadershipity.com. Look for our upcoming book, The Pyramid of Leadershipity. Super excited about that as we talk about those key itties of the foundation for leaders. Um, if you enjoyed today's episode, please continue listening. Rate winners find a way. Five stars. I work hard to find value delivering stories from the 1% leaders for you every episode. Matthew, of course, you didn't disappoint again, Matt. So it was so good. And now, and now we got episode two teed up for, uh, you know, a challenge of, uh, of the men today is leaders and leading. And I think that's a, a huge topic. Um, and, and, and we didn't get deep into your life altering, you know, uh, challenge uh, with the blood clot, which is, uh, which we'll have to leave our audience for uh, episode two. So I'm pretty excited about that. Sounds good. Looking forward right. to it. Excellent. Great to see you, Matt. As everybody, we'll see you next week, Fridays, every Friday, 1230 Eastern, 930 AM Pacific, live on Leadershipity YouTube channel. We'll see you then.